Welcome to the Georgia Public Policy Foundation's Georgia Legends. Hello, I'm Bill Shipp, and joining me today are three of Georgia's political legends, former Governor Ernest Vandiver, former Governor Carl Sanders, and former Lieutenant Governor and Speaker of the Georgia House, George T. Smith. These political contemporaries are here today to discuss the personalities, the events, and the historical context of Georgia in the early 1960s, a pivotal era in our state's history, in which the decisions made by these men and their colleagues shaped the destinies of our state and nation today. The most prominent figure in state politics at that time, and one of the great national and international figures was Senator Richard Russell, who was nearing the end of his career. And this found Governor Vandiver and Governor Sanders, at least on opposite ends of the bench or opposite ends of the field, as Governor Sanders, after leaving the governor's office, at least speculated about running for that office. No, I, hadn't, I hadn't left the governor's office at that point. I was still in there. Carl and I have been on, on different sides at different times, but we have remained friends. And I have always praised Carl for some of the things that he did, particularly in that meeting at the governor's mansion. And uh, I supported uh, Carter, mainly because I thought Carl was running against Senator Russell. And I felt that Senator Russell was in such a state of health that he shouldn't have any opposition. And that was where we uh, changed our courses. The story goes that you were getting some encouragement, or at least you believe you were getting encouragement from President Johnson. Oh, I was not from President Johnson. I, I think Senator Russell and President Johnson had had their differences over the Civil Rights Bill, and, and I think they, although they no longer were as close as they had been previously, I think that uh, Senator Johnson still respected Dick Russell and recognized that he was a, a, a power in the Senate. And I guess I did get some encouragement. But uh, I finally concluded, after much deliberation with my wife and my children, uh, that that was uh, not the place. I'd been up to Washington enough. I knew how that thing operated. I knew you had to sit in the United States Senate for 12 years before you ever really got a chance to stand up on the floor and say anything because you're under that seniority system. So, of course, I did not run. I think Ernie uh, felt like that I had... Uh, had reached a point where he thought that uh, I was going to run. And of course, as he said, when Jimmy Carter, who had run in 66, while I was coming out of the governor's office, we had the Jimmy Carter, Bo Calloway, Lester Maddox uh, situation, which was about as confused as a three governor's situation back when they had Herman Talmadge and Ellis Arnold and uh, Gene Talmadge all Emmy, involved. Emmy Thompson. Jimmy, Jim, Emmy Thompson involved. But, Anyway, uh, when I ran in 70 against Carter, uh, of course, that's when uh, uh, I think Carter, and I, I, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but I think Carter had, had led Ernie to, to, to believe that if Senator Russell died or decided to leave office, that he would appoint him to the United States Senate. Well, let's which talk. A, let's which, talk. Is a, which is a fair enough political deal. I mean, I think that's uh, that's that's considered to be. Uh, you know, I th I can understand that. Well, well, let's talk a little bit. Each of you have suffered some political setback or disappointment after those halcyon days of getting the state through a very trying time in the late fifties and early sixties. And that Senator Rus Russell affair address that, Ernie. Well, uh, when Carter was running uh, for governor. Uh, he flew from Americas to Livonia and was met by two people in Livonia, Bob Meredith and Andy Hill, who uh, I think Carl was in school yeah. with him. Uh, Bob Meredith is not dead, but Andy Hill is still living. And uh, he told them specifically, they told me this, that he would appoint me to the United States Senate if Senator Russell died during that period of time. And uh, we went on a fishing trip right after the election, and he asked me if there was anything I wanted to do right then. And I said, well, I enjoyed being Adjutant General. And uh, while 
I'm waiting. I'd, I'd like to be Adjutant General again. And he later told somebody that he fulfilled all the obligations uh, when he appointed me Adjutant General. <laughs> well, that, that, that's an interesting story. And, of course, a uh, sequel to that is that Ernie, having sort of uh, supported him in 70, when he and I had a real knockdown, drag-out, dirty race. I mean, he, he ran basically as a George Wallace a supporter. Well, well let's set and, that up, though. Let's and, set that up. You, 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 you've been governor, and generally you got very high marks during your administration, and attempted to make a comeback in 1970 in what you have just described, in what I believe, having covered several races, was one of the all-time brutal governor's races. Well, it was, and, and if the mistake I probably made, uh, and it's still true today to a great extent, was that there are two different Georgias. I mean, I don't know of a governor yet that has been born and raised in Atlanta, uh, maybe a hundred years ago, that got elected governor. And of course, uh, I when I left to matter. Yeah, when I left, yeah, Lester. But he got he got elected by the legislature. Well, I, I, I want to talk about the Lester matter. But, it, but anyway, talk about the when I got uh, when I uh, ran, I, instead of going back to Augusta, my hometown and resuming my law practice there, I started building a law firm in Atlanta. And of course, when we got into the Carter-Sanders race in 1970, I was characterized as an Atlanta lawyer, and he characterized himself as an Atlanta, a liberal Atlanta lawyer who had uh, brought about uh, uh, integration through the public schools, and he was characterized as a peanut farmer who was a supporter of people like George Wallace. And that's the basis on which that race was run. In fact, you had refused to invite George Wallace. <laughs> and he made the statement in the campaign that he would invite him to join. Right, Georgia. right. And I, I, I hadn't refused to invite him. What I refused to do was to allow him to come and disrupt the legislature. We was in a special session back in the, mm -hmm. uh, when we were re rewriting the Constitution. And I said, look, we're not going to spend $25,000 a day listening to George Wallace. If you want to invite him, bring him to Atlanta, put him in one of the hotels, and let him speak. Well, of course, he didn't want to do that. He wanted to come in front of the legislature and shut down the legislature and make his speech. But anyway, we ran that campaign. And of course, one of the things that uh, they did in that campaign, as you know, was uh, I had been a part owner of the Atlanta Hawks, made up primarily of black basketball players. We had won the Western Division, and Tom Cousins and I were back in the locker room congratulating them on winning, and they were opening up champagne, and one of the uh, ball players, Bill Bridges and one other, uh, was pouring champagne on my head and on Cousins. Well, they took, Carter took that, uh, his people took that picture and sent it to every church in South Georgia and to every other redneck organization they could find. Every bar barbershop. Every, every barbershop. Every barbershop. Uh, insinuating, you know, that I was wrapped up with the blacks and that he was not. And that was the kind of campaign that we ran. And it was a, it was a nasty, uh, dirty campaign. But in retrospect, as I look at it now in, in light of my own, the, the, the rest of my life and my career, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I have concluded, rightly or wrongly, that when we had the rule where you served four years and you knew you had to get out. You once, once you got started, you did everything you could to do, accomplish what you could in that four years. Now they've changed the rule. And now the first thing a governor does when he gets elected is try to figure out how he's going to get reelected the second time, and he tries not to rock too many boats. And the truth of the matter is, of course, the legislature has changed somewhat too, but generally they don't get as much done in eight years as they used to be able to get done in four years. George Teague, I believe you're the, you're the only person in this century who's been elected to all three branches of Georgia government. I'm the only person that's ever been elected to all of them. Now, there's three other people served in all of them in, in, in the capacities I have, but none of them were elected to all of them. I elected everyone I was opposite. Poor politician, couldn't get involved in appointment anything. And yet you say you were appointed to one thing. Yeah, yeah. I know that. <laughs> that's that's so elected by the legislature. <laughs> so you served Speaker of the House, Lieutenant Governor in the Court of Appeals, and, and then Supreme went to Court. the Georgia Supreme Court and rose to become presiding justice. You also ran for governor in 1974, and you were defeated, and then you had a couple other setbacks. Yeah. Tell us about well, it. the biggest setback was uh, was when I was promised. You see. 
the judges in the, in the court of the state of Georgia are the only elected officials who has a ceiling on the age upon which they can serve uh, beyond which they have to get off. Uh, you can stay governor, uh, since they got where you can be reelected two terms, or you can stay in the legislature, any elected officer, as long as you can keep getting elected. But in, in, in uh, the courts, when I went on the courts, 70 years old, when you got 70 years old, you had to get out. Now, you could stay on if you want to, but you forfeited your retirement. Well, that wasn't a very good thing to look forward to when you're 70 years old, you know, giving up your retirement. Well, uh, uh, Governor Harris promised Roy Barnes and me, we went down to see him, standing in his office, shook hands on it, Roy Barnes did the talking, said, you get that bill passed and I'll sign it. But I got it passed unanimously in the House and the Senate. He vetoed it. Uh, his, his his reason was that he didn't want anybody to senile on the courts. I said, the problem there is, Governor, they elect senile governors. That's the problem we have in this state. <laughs> they can't remember their promises. So that went along, and we finally got him to agree to set it up to set. Two years later, we passed it again. He put it to 7, 75. So when Governor Miller was running the first time, it, this happened in, in uh, in Washington, D.C. at the J.W. Marriott Hotel, whenever they had the Chamber of Commerce, he used to have the big meetings of that night. Uh, he and I were talking. And I told him that, that was just, Harris had just turned it down again for the third time. Uh, so he said, you get that bill. If I'm elected governor next year, you get that bill passed. And I won't do to you what Governor Harris did. I'll sign that thing. I got it passed. 53 out of 56 votes in the Senate, 103 to nothing in the House. He vetoed it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they all elected their senile. They can't remember the promises. Well, I think all three of you just told you learned, you've had a graduate course in political science. They just got turned down one time. I got turned down twice. <laughs> now, I, I, I want to I make another comment. After, after Ernie and I sort of separated on the Carter election, uh, then Ernie later uh, ran for the Senate. When Senator Russell died, I concluded at that point, too, that I was not a candidate. And, of course, this shows how politics work. I mean, he and I had, had sort of been close political allies right up until the Carter election when he chose to, uh, and he gave his reasons. And then I chose, to, rather than support him, I chose to support Sam Nunn because Sam Nunn was an unknown uh, legislator, and uh, he didn't know, he'd never run a statewide race. And so he was sort of floundering out there. Ernie can probably talk about the campaign more he, than I he can. He hadn't made any political enemies either. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he hadn't. That's right. But I finally sent Norman Underwood over there, who kind of helped organize his campaign. And, of course, Sam Nunn got elected, and he's been in the Senate ever since. And I must make a confession. I wrote a column in 1972 and said there was only one thing I was certain of that year. And Sam Nunn would never be elected to the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's talk about another watershed in Georgia politics. Another Before we get to that, let me, let me uh, reiterate something that Carl said. Uh, Jimmy Carter ran for governor as a conservative. There's no doubt about it. When he, I talked to him, everything he said he was endorsed, conservative. He endorsed Lester Maddox that year. We were running against me for lieutenant governor in, 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 in Augusta, Georgia, endorsed him. Everything he said was conservative, and I was the most surprised man in the state of Georgia when I heard his inaugural <laughs> speech. <laughs> and he, he said what he said, and uh, I think everybody on the stand was shocked. And I later said, uh, somebody asked me, said, uh, how did Georgia get, get through the school situation? And I said, well, I think reason, one reason Georgia's been successful was we were able to get through it without anybody getting hurt, without any riots or anything. And I think maybe that helped Jimmy Carter get elected president. Jimmy Carter came back and said, no, sir, what got me elected president was when I put Martin Luther King's picture on the wall in the Capitol. Well, time I thought, change I and, thought perception be told. and perceptions yes. differ. <laughs> uh, another watershed, you mentioned Lester Maddox, and I believe this was a watershed. For the first time, we saw a harbinger of the rise of the Republican Party in Bo Calloway, who won a plurality in the general election, which by then had become the decisive factor in electing a governor. But he was not seated, because, and he was not seated because the General Assembly was still controlled by Democrats as it is today. No, that that and, isn't really the reason why. All right, well, you, 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 were, you had a front row seat and a big hand in putting him in office. So. 
he was not seated, Bo Calloway had the election locked up. But he would not listen to anybody. Some of his biggest supporters were people like John Sibley, who was, uh, Ernie talked about being head of the Sibley Commission, who was a wonderful man, a good friend of mine, Mr. Bob Woodruff, and a lot of the other major uh, contributors to political campaigns in Georgia. But Bo, uh, they would try to sit down and talk to him, and I don't know what the conversation was, but one of the things that, I, that he did, the first thing he did, I left $140 million in surplus money when I left the governor's office. That was more money at that time than any governor had, had ever left in the treasury. However, Bo Calloway knew at the time he was running that I was accumulating some surplus. I'd spent all the money we needed to spend, and, and I was just going to try to pass it on to the next guy. He got up in, in the park, in Hurt Park, and made a speech. And his speech was that I should have spent every dime, that I should not have allowed any surplus to accumulate. I should have spent all that money. And I answered him, and he came by the mansion the next day and said, you know, I made a big mistake. He said, I shouldn't have made that speech. I said, Bo, I'm not running against you. You aren't running against me. You better run against somebody that you're out there running against. So he went on. Ellis Arnold was in the race. Ellis Arnold came in second behind uh, uh, Lester Maddox in the primary. At that time, Ellis Arnold had about a $50,000 campaign deficit. That was back when politics wasn't quite as expensive. Some of Ellis Arnold's friends went to Bo Calloway and said, Bo, if you will help Ellis Arnold you get elected governor, eliminate this $50,000 campaign deficit, we will all join your campaign and support you in the general election. And the story goes, and I, I know it's true, is that he told them no deal. He wasn't going to do that. And as a result, then Ellis Arnold's friend said, well, if he's not willing to help Ellis Arnold get rid of his campaign deficit, we're going to conduct a write-in vote in the general election for Ellis Arnold. And they then went about and put Ellis Arnold into the general election as a write-in candidate. When the election was held, neither Bo Calloway nor Lester Maddox got 50% of the vote. Under the present Constitution at that time, if you didn't get more than 50% of the vote, the election then goes into the House of Representatives and each member of the House votes for governor. That's how that got uh, stated. Ellis Arnold's crowd kept Bo Calloway from being elected by the popular vote. Once it got into General Assembly, it went down the party lines. It was either a question, are you going to vote for Bo Calloway, a Republican, for governor, or are you going to vote for Lester Maddox, who says he's a Democrat for governor? And of course, they voted for Lester Maddox. Now, they not only voted for Lester, but one of the reasons that they voted for Lester, and I think George T. can speak to that, is that they knew that Lester had never, ever held a public uh, elected office, and they were in the process of taking the power from the governor's office and putting more of that power back into the legislature. And from that point on, the governorship of Georgia, which had always in the past been a strong governorship, no longer became a strong governorship. It became a question of what the legislature was going to do relative to presenting the budget, what the legislature was going to do relative to appointing committee chairman and so forth. And that's how that took place. Well, let me tell you something you, behind the scenes that you, you all don't know about. Sam Marcel, who was mayor at that time, I believe he was mayor at that time, but anyway, Sam Marcel came to me and asked me to be the write-in candidate before they ever went to, 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 to Ellis Arnold. And I turned it flat down. I said, y'all are crazy. I play with the rules. I'm not, I said, a write-in candidate can't win, and you're going to make a mistake if you do that. He said, well, I'm going there tonight. And, and they, they were meeting at the Jewish Center up at, close to, uh, uh, to the railroad station up there. He said, I'm going to nominate you tonight. I said, we've talked about it. And you're the man for it. I said, tell you what, Mayor, if you nominate me, and that comes out tomorrow, I'll have, a, I'll have a press conference at 10 o'clock on this Capitol steps in which I'll announce the whole uh, process you're making. So they went up there and he told them what I said, so then when they went there, this on. Ernie, by that time, you, you weren't on the sidelines. You were still mixed up in it, but you were watching from afar, and the issue of legislative 
independents have been part of the campaign in 58 right. had finally come to fruition. We were trying to get a balance between the executive department and the legislative uh, branch of government, and it, it shifted from the governor to the legislature at that time that Carl is talking about. Now, we're talking about surplus funds. Marvin Griffin left me $2 million in a surplus fund to run the state of Georgia, and at that time it was costing a million dollars a day to run the, the state. We were able to go four years without raising taxes, and we were able to uh, make some changes in the mental health program, which Carl and others uh, followed in their administration. Uh, I left Carl $65 million in the Treasury. Carl has left, left $165, $167 million in the Treasury. But before that time, they, the, the procedure was to spend everything you had. And apparently that's the, the, the custom now. I was talking to Senator Russell about it one time. He said, Ernie said, what's your budget? I said, well, Senator, it's, uh, it's over $300 million a year. He says, my God, he said, when I was governor, the budget was $32 million a year. And now it's close to $12 now, billion. Now it's a $12 billion? <laughs> 12 well, billion. well, not only did they not leave surplus money, but back in the 30s and even, I guess, in the 40s, when one governor would finish his term, they generally burned all the papers. They destroyed all the documents so that when the next governor came in, he couldn't go through whatever they had done and start shooting at them. So they absolutely, when you went in the governor's office until the late 50s and the 60s, there weren't any papers there for you to even see what had gone on in the other administration. And as you well know, they even had back in those days, they had sessions that lasted sometimes the last day of a governor's term where they would be signing pardons and paroles for people in the prison, depending on what the charge was and how much money they got for what they signed those things till they went out. And that, that clean slate is a legacy of the Ed Rivers administration out of the 1930s. You know, one of the first things Lester Matters came to me for after he was elected governor, said, I want to appoint a commission to investigate costs and his administration. <laughs> yeah, right. You remember that? Oh, do I remember that. And, and, uh, and, uh, we, and so we were going to appoint it out of the Senate. I remember that. And I remember uh, Bobby Rowan was going to be his uh, strong uh, banner carrier in the Senate for to investigate you. So uh, uh, I wanted the former uh, solicitor general from down in uh, Newton yeah, to, to do the, uh, to investigate. do the investigation. Yeah. So in the Senate, uh, Holloway, I appointed Holloway as chairman of it, and I forgot who else we got, and I put Bobby Rowan on that way we could watch him. And, it's, and uh, of course, we never had things fixed like that, and you understand that. But anyway, the committee made a hard and fast rule that only Holloway could hold a press conference. <laughs> Just kill Rowan. Well, well, they, they went through the investigation, and they found, uh, nothing. they found absolutely the guy that Lester had appointed or that they selected to hold the investigation said he had examined all the records of administration, and he couldn't find one iota of anything improper. Well, there is a let me, let me uh, add, there is a perception that Lester Maddox somehow gave the, the the state a black eye nationally. But was he really that bad a governor? Well, the business of riding a bicycle backwards uh, in public and that sort of thing, uh, it, it made him look like a clown, really. And I think I think Lester was honest. I don't think he was crooked. But I had to deal with an administration that had been uh, corrupt, as you very well remember. And my first bill, House Bill 1, was honesty in government. And we cleaned up the purchasing department and put Bill Bowden, who Carl yeah, later used as Lawton Shaw, instead of Lawton Shaw. And Bill and I and the legislature got that cleaned up, and there hadn't been any problems since. And uh, we really have not had any big scandals in the state government since that time. You can't serve in, uh, on a board and sell something to the state. That was what the, the big deal was back in those days. Uh, George Whitman, who was uh, president of the Board of Education, he was one of the big sellers of goods to the state. And so we changed that uh, immediately. With calls happened with Lester's uh, position, as I look at it, when he first went into governor's office, was that he was not over there to, to really run the departments, 
he was over there to protect the people against those scallywags that were in the government. And one of the things I give him credit for, because of the, of the uncertainty of who was going to be the governor, they didn't know until uh, the legislature convened in January, I had to go through and make up the budget. Back then, you made the budget for two years. I don't know whether they still do it two years or one year, but one I, year. I went back for two years. I put in the first two-year budget of the Maddox administration, and he did not change the budget. And some of that was some of those huge increases for teacher salaries and other faculty salaries. And the other thing he did, which I admire him for, some of the people who had been out there supporting him the strongest, he realized once he got in there that they were not qualified to hold some of those offices. And he left in place a lot of the appointees that had already been put there, and those people helped him go through that four years. And I think, you know, on, on, on all counts, it was not a bad four-year period for the state of Georgia. George, see, you may have a little different perspective in as much as you ran against I have a much, much different he, perspective. He defeated you. He was intellectually dishonest. He wouldn't, he, he wouldn't keep a promise to you. He promised you to do something. He wouldn't do it. You couldn't depend upon it to save your soul. Uh, he made several promises to me if I'd help him get elected to governor, what he would do. And when, when that happened, once again, he forgot him one of those and, and yet and yet the the legislature became independent because it became of independent was that a good that's thing? A, uh, that was exactly it. the legislature took over took control before he ever got elected governor and george l and george t ran the government for the four years he didn't he didn't care let me give you one little instance this is a good story i got to tell it the first year he was in there on the last day of the session at five o'clock in the afternoon with, with the commerce committee out trying to pass upon the, the the budget which is very familiar theme song. Governor Maddox had a $200,000 port, port barrel thing he wanted to give to somebody in Columbus, and he was asking me to look after it for him, and I'd been holding that thing together all day long, and they were stuck on that. The House said, we ain't going to give it to you. I said, we are going to give it to him. About 5 o'clock, it went down, the last day of the session, I started to go down and talk to the governor. I got down and said, I said, I want to speak to the governor. He ain't here. I said, what do you mean not here? Where is he? He said, he's in Macon. I said, what's he doing in Macon? He said, he's down there riding his bicycle backwards to entertain the children. Here his appropriation bill, the last day of the session, he's in, he's in Macon riding the bicycle backwards. That's the reason it went over just where you put it in. I went back up and opened the door to the conference committee. I said, forget the 200000 throw it out and pass that sucker. We did. And you know what? He never did question anybody what happened to his $200,000. We'll probably have to offer Lester Maddox equal time after a very fine story. <laughs>